So today we're going to talk about acetabular fractures. It's an area of ER imaging that seems at first sight to be more complicated than it actually is. So let's see if we can break it down into a few simple concepts. Here are our objectives for today. We're going to talk about where the anterior and posterior columns are in the acetabulum, what the difference is between a column and a wall. We're going to do a general overview of the Judean lateral nerve classification system, and then we're going to talk about the only four things you actually need to know about the Judean lateral nerve system. And then we're going to see how we can use our day-to-day -day routine CT images to classify these, and then there are a couple of bonus features at the end. So I said there are only four things that you need to know to classify these fractures, and here they are. By the end of this talk, I want you to be very comfortable with what an acetabular wall, column, transverse, and both column fracture are. So, let's get started. First of all, let's talk about the function of the acetabular columns. So they're basically part of a large system that transfers weight from your spine down into the lower extremities. So here is a skeleton. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this skeleton and we're going to zoom up on the um, acetabulum and the pelvis from the medial aspect. And when we think about weight coming down from the spine, it's going to transfer weight from the lumbar spine into our first three sacral segments. From there, those three sacral segments are going to transfer weight into this structure, the sciatic buttress. Now, this is not a concept that we use too much in radiology, but it's going to be very important. And in fact, I want you to keep the sciatic buttress in mind because we're going to need this concept later. After the sciatic buttress, though, what we're going to do is transfer that weight into the anterior and posterior columns of the acetabulum, and from there down into the lower extremity through the hip. So in terms of these columns, the anterior column is this structure that involves the pubic body, the superior pubic ramus, and a large portion of the anterior iliac wing. The posterior column involves the ischium and a small portion of the ilium up to the level of the greater sciatic notch. So if those are the columns, what is a wall? That's just a projection from the anterior and posterior column that's going to deepen the acetabular cup and provide stability to the femoral head. This golf ball is not particularly stable sitting on this golf tee, but if we added a structure equivalent to the anterior and posterior columns, you would see it would become a bunch more stable. Therefore, it makes sense that if you break a wall, the femoral head becomes unstable. I think this concept is rather well demonstrated by this particular case. So this is a patient whose knee hit the dashboard in a motor vehicle crash. The femoral head was dislocated posteriorly, and as you can see, it just shredded that posterior wall on the way out. Unless all of this posterior wall is repaired, this femoral head is going to remain unstable. This is all very well and good, but on your CT images, how are you going to tell the difference between a wall and a column fracture? Because it, as it turns out, the CTs don't come color-coded. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use the quadrilateral plate rule. Just to be clear, the quadrilateral plate is the medial wall of the acetabulum. I've shaded it in green here on the 3D image, but on your routine axial images, there it is, the medial wall of the acetabulum, and there it is on the coronal images. Now, in general, the quick rule of thumb is that if that acetabular fracture extends through the quadrilateral plate, you're going to call it a column fracture. If it doesn't, it's just a wall fracture. Now, there's a little asterisk on here because the anterior wall of the acetabulum is so small that in order to break it, sometimes you have to take a little bit of the quadrilateral plate with you. But otherwise, this rule is going to apply to all other wall and column fracture types. So, if you see a quadrilateral plate fracture, you know you're looking for a column fracture. So, let's practice this. In this patient, am I looking for a wall or a column fracture? I have an acetabular fracture, there it is, comminuted fragments at the back, and I will tell you that if you scroll up and down, the quadrilateral plate is going to be intact in this patient. Therefore, big fragments off the back, but no involvement of the quadrilateral plate, this is a wall fracture. Unlike this patient, I've got a fracture that's clearly involving the quadrilateral plate at the medial wall of this acetabulum. Since I know it's involving the quadrilateral plate, now I know I'm looking for a column fracture in this patient. Okay, so in terms of the four concepts that you needed to know, we've actually already worked out two of them. We know what a wall is and what it does. We know where the columns are, and we know on a routine CT image that we're going to use the quadrilateral plate to tell the difference between the two of them. So now let's actually take a look at the classification system itself. Here it is, the Judea-Lateronel classification system. 
Now, at first glance, I can tell you that this classification system has one advantage and two disadvantages. The advantage is that it has a really cool French name, Jude l'Eternel. Uh, the disadvantages, though, are that there are 10 different fracture types, and they are shown to you in this sagittal 3D projection with the femoral head removed that is not going to be available to you at the time of the initial interpretation. In fact, what you can do is you can take this set of 10 fracture types and look at this CT image and say to yourself, well, I have to apply one of these fracture types to this CT image. It feels like it can get complicated very quickly. Now, I work at a tertiary referral center, so I will tell you that when this particular patient arrives, what they're going to get is a report that says left anterior column posterior hemitransverse acetabular fracture. But we also get a lot of outside transfers, and when you read the outside reports, you can see a wide variety of comfort level with these fractures. For example, the outside report might say left acetabular fracture involving the anterior and posterior columns. This is actually pretty darn good. Comminuted left acetabular fracture, where we're getting a little less comfortable here, and then occasionally we'll get a report like this that says multiple pelvic fractures are present. I'm not even going to tell you what side they're on. Please transfer this patient somewhere else. Hopefully, by the end of this lecture, we can get you up to about this level. That would be pretty awesome. This is a good classification of that fracture that we just saw. So, the classification system itself, we're not going to look at all of it at once. It's actually divided into two different categories, the simple fracture types along the top and the complex ones along the bottom. So let's start with the simple fracture types along the top. What does simple mean in this setting? Simple means that the patient has one dominant fracture line that may be a little bit comminuted. In fact, in terms of those fracture lines, you've already learned quite a few of them. So a simple fracture line would mean one wall, anterior posterior, or one column, anterior posterior or a straight line from front to back. So since we've talked quite extensively about these two, let be absolutely clear that we know the difference between these two with this case right here. So what I've got is an axial CT image, and we're going to be keeping our eye on the right acetabulum in this patient. As we start scrolling down, we see that there is a fracture along the posterior aspect here, and we're gonna keep following it down because we want to know whether or not it involves the quadrilateral plate. And in this case, we can say clearly it does. So I've got a fracture of the posterior acetabulum involving the quadrilateral plate. That means I'm thinking I've got a posterior column fracture. Now in this patient, I actually don't even need the sagittals. I've kind of worked this out already, but what I can do is I can scroll through the sagittals as well. And as I come across that medial aspect, there is that fracture involving the quadrilateral plate and going out the back, I'm clearly looking at a posterior column fracture. Now, a quick note on anterior column fractures. For the purposes of drawing the diagram, I drew the anterior column fracture to look like this. But, as you can see, the anterior column involves all of this portion of the iliac wing, which basically means that the fracture can involve any of that portion of the anterior column. So an anterior column fracture can look like any of these. But the posterior column does not go up the iliac wing. So if I've got a fracture going up the iliac wing, I already kind of know what I'm dealing with. So if that acetabular fracture goes up the iliac wing, it's always going to be anterior column. I'm not talking about this fracture, right? This is an isolated iliac wing fracture. It has to involve the acetabular articular surface to be called an acetabular fracture. But when that acetabular fracture goes up the iliac wing, always anterior column. Keep it simple. Test yourself one more time then. What kind of fracture is this? Lots of comminuted fracture fragments in the back. Intact quadrilateral plate we're thinking that this is a posterior wall fracture. All right, so we got a pretty good idea of what the one wall and the one column fractures are. So we've got one more simple fracture type to talk about, and that's the transverse fractures. For a transverse fracture, the coronal images are your friend. You're going to take your mouse and you're gonna sit your mouse in one spot and scroll from front to back through that fracture. If you do not have to move your mouse very much, because that fracture is in pretty much a straight line from front to back, then you are dealing with a transverse acetabular fracture like we have in this patient. It's gonna follow that same plane in your line of sight all the way from front to back. Now, a transverse fracture, by definition, has to cross the anterior and posterior columns, but we do not call it a both column fracture type. That name is reserved in Jude Le Tournay for a very specific fracture type we'll talk about in a minute. 
In addition, of course, it must cross both the anterior and posterior walls, but we do not call it an, a transverse fracture with anterior and posterior wall. This is a simple fracture line. With a simple, single fracture line, we're going to call it a simple name, a transverse acetabular fracture. So, if these are the simple fractures then, uh, what are the complex ones? Well, a complex fracture just means some combination of these things that you've learned already. So here they are. These are the complex fracture types. And I want you to keep in mind that the Jeudet Lettronel system was created by surgeons. Therefore, they are not going to describe a fracture separately if they don't have to fix it separately. So let's take this one as an example. This is a transverse with posterior wall. This is not that simple fracture line that went across everything. This means that there is comminution of the posterior wall, and therefore I'm going to have to do a separate surgery to fix it. Now let's look at this visually because we're radiologists. Here is a fracture, and I'm going to take my mouse, and I'm going to sit from the front of this fracture, and I'm going to see that I really don't have to move my mouse at all. This fracture is going in a straight line from front to back. Different patient, but these fractures all look the same. Simple fracture line, I'm going to call this a simple transverse fracture. Unlike this patient, here I am, I do have that same transverse fracture line. I've got my mouse in about the same place, and there is a fracture that follows that transverse plane all the way from front to back. But as I get towards the back of the acetabulum, I can see that that posterior wall is comminuted, shredded into numerous little fragments at the back there. So in this case, I'm going to call this a transverse with posterior wall. From a surgical perspective, what does that mean? When I fix this, there it is. There is a transverse fracture with just a couple of screws securing that fracture line, little percutaneous excess sites to secure this transverse fracture, simple surgery. But in this patient, you can see the large open surgery here to go back in, reconstruct all those tiny little puzzle pieces into a posterior wall and secure it with multiple plates and screws. This is a far more complicated surgery than this one, transverse with posterior wall, requiring that separate surgery to fixate that at the back. So we're going to follow that same theme here. Posterior column with posterior wall is going to be exactly the same. If the posterior wall is comminuted, we will describe it separately because it's going to need a separate surgery. Now what about that transverse fracture that we are already pretty familiar with? If we've got a transverse fracture, but we've got an additional fracture in the axial plane that goes down into the obturator foramen, it's going to make a T-shape, and that's what we're going to call this fracture, a T-shaped acetabular fracture. Now this one has the longest name. And because it has the longest name, it tends to scare people. But you're already really familiar with both of these patterns. You know that a fracture coming from the iliac wing and going down through the acetabulum involving the quadrilateral plate is going to be an anterior column fracture. And you know how to identify a transverse fracture as we keep it in that same line of sight in the coronal images. If we put them together, we get an anterior column posterior hemitransverse. Well, believe it or not, there's only one more. And remember that we were going to keep that sciatic buttress in mind. And that both column is a fracture name that's reserved for a specific fracture type under Jude Letronel. Well, here it is, the both column acetabular fracture. And what this does is it completely separates the sciatic buttress from the acetabular articular surface. There is now no connection between the sciatic buttress and the acetabular articular surface. Unlike this one, here there's still a little bit of that acetabular articular surface that con is connected to the sciatic buttress. How are we going to work this out on our routine CT images? Well, in this case, actually, the sagittals are going to be your friend. So, so you can get your orientation again. There we are. We've got the lumbar spine um, with our lower lumbar facets coming in there. And as we scroll across, we're going to start getting into the sacrum, which is broken in this patient. But we're going to come across until we get to the SI joint, and now here is the sciatic buttress. It is this big, thick piece of bone that's going to transfer the weight from the sacrum down into our acetabulum. Now, as I go from this sciatic buttress, if I try to draw a line down the anterior column to the acetabular articular surface, I have to go through a fracture. I cannot get there without going through a fracture line when I go down the front. And when I go down the back, in fact, I cannot connect the sciatic buttress to the posterior acetabulum without going through a fracture line either, which means that this acetabular articular surface is completely separated from the sciatic buttress in this patient. I'll show you this again in a 3D image. There it is, the sciatic buttress. I cannot get to the acetabular articular surface in this patient without going through fractures. Therefore, this is a both-column associated acetabular fracture.
Now, of course, there's no need to memorize the Jude Letonel classification system. It's best just to have it somewhere handy for reference and somewhere you can look it up if you need to, particularly when you're first learning the system. Now, for your interest, here are the five most common fracture types, but at this point, you have actually seen all 10 Jude Letonel fracture types. So let's test yourself. This fracture has this line of sight transverse component going all the way from front to back. But as we come down the axials, we see that there's an additional fracture going straight down into the obturator foramen. Line of sight component, additional fracture going down into the obturator foramen. Therefore, this fracture is a complex fracture. It is T-shaped. Let's talk about a couple of complications. We're not going to go through all of these in the interest of time, but we'll pick up on a couple of them. So femoral head impaction injuries, these are analogous to the hill sacs injuries in the shoulder. They can either be impaction or shearing type fractures. When you describe them, you're going to describe size and location, but you're also going to let your surgeons know whether it's cranial to this structure, which is the fovea. Everything cranial to this is considered the weight-bearing articular surface. So if your fracture involves that surface, you need to let them know the prognosis is not as good once you've got that weight-bearing articular surface involvement. Intraarticular fragments. Once they get large, they can certainly cause trouble with reduction. Take a look at this normal hip on this side. The distance between the femoral head and the acetabular articular surface is pretty much the same all the way across, as it should be. In this side, though, they couldn't quite get the femoral head back into the acetabulum properly, and we see that lack of congruence of the femoral head because of this large intraarticular fragment. That's going to have to come out before they can get good acetabular congruence. So take home points. We talked about wall fractures. That's a fracture of that rim that's deepening the acetabular cup. It can certainly result in hip joint instability when it occurs. We're only going to call a wall fracture in addition to another fracture type when that posterior wall is comminuted. A column fracture is a fracture through the acetabulum that's going to involve the acetabular pla uh, quadrilateral plate, and it's just going to disrupt transfer of weight or force to the lower extremity. We're going to use the quadrilateral plate on our routine CT images to work out whether we're dealing with a wall or column fracture. A transverse fracture is a horizontal fracture that's going to follow our line of sight on the coronal images. The coronal images are our friend for these transverse fractures. And a both column associated fracture separates the entire acetabular articular surface from the sciatic buttress. So with these concepts in mind of when to call a wall, a column, a transverse or both column fracture, you've already got a pretty darn good idea of how to apply this classification system. So I challenge you to go out there, find some pelvis CTs and start classifying some acetabular fractures. If you'd like to learn more or get some more references on this, here are some great resources to refer to.